You're listening to Summer in the School of Faith, a sermon series about discovering the foundations of our faith. For more information about First Baptist Startville, please visit www.fbcstartville.com. Go ahead and take your Bible, please, and open it to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, as we continue today looking at the Lord's Prayer. And for our guest today, let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing. You are right in the middle. You've come right in the middle of a three-year series where during the summer we look at the foundations of our faith. And so last summer, uh, when you guys were here, that for those of you who came back, you remember we were in the Ten Commandments. And this year we're looking at the Lord's Prayer. And then next year, when you come back for camp in the city, we'll be looking at the Apostles' Creed. And so what we're doing during the summer, we're taking the opportunity to lay the foundations of our faith. And so what we've been doing uh, since, I don't remember when we started this, but anyway, we started and we've been looking through the Lord's Prayer line by line. And today, we come to that very important section, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12. And I've entitled today's message, Forgiveness. I've entitled today's message, Forgiveness. You know, sometimes I think all of us can testify that it's easier to tell someone else to do something than it is for you to actually do something yourself. Whether it's uh, uh, losing weight, it's always easier, in my case, to tell somebody else how to exercise and how to eat, but then to actually put that in, into practice is something entirely different. But I remember this at a previous church when we were going through a building campaign. We, we had a master contractor in the room. He was a well-respected builder in the area. And uh, we also had these experts that they call architects who were drawing what should be. And it was so fun to watch Tommy and these uh, architects go back and forth because they would say, architects would say, well, this is going to work here. And then Tommy would say from his experience, that's never going to work. And well, it was just fun to see them go back and forth. And many of the plans that they had looked good on paper from the architect, but actually putting the plan on paper is one thing. Building the building, well, that's quite another thing. So we begin today talking about a subject that is invariably difficult, and it's invariably sharp. And remember how we're learning the Lord's Prayer. It's it's the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that the Lord has given us is unlike anything that the world has ever heard before. And remember that these, as we read this, this isn't just words on paper. These are words by which God intends for us to build our lives. Let's look at the Bible and hear the word of the Lord from Matthew 6 and verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, I want you to notice something in the Bible. Look at what follows in verse 14. Jesus elaborates on this point. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. There are no unforgiving people in heaven. Now, that's what Jesus said. Sort of stings, doesn't it, when you think about it? There are no unforgiving people in heaven. See, this section is so difficult. This section has such a sting to it that Jesus, he has to elaborate on just how serious this whole matter of forgiveness is. Look at what he says again in verse 14 through 15. Look how specific it is. There's no mincing of words there. It just, Jesus just lays it right out there. And here's what he says. Don't miss this. He says, withholding forgiveness means withholding eternity. Withholding forgiveness means withholding eternity. And let's look back at the prayer. Remember, we don't want to just pull something out of its context and hang our doctrine on it or establish some kind of truth from it. No, we want the text to read us more than we want to read the text. And so, let's look back at the prayer. Let's make sure that we're understanding what it is that the Lord is calling us to. Remember, He doesn't just want to treat us like, you know, we're puppets on a string, and so He just says, well, you just repeat after me. 
It's not what he does in the prayer. He doesn't just say, you know, uh, write this down. No, he says something different. He says, do this. He says, live in this way. And so, what's he doing by giving us this prayer? Remember, he's giving us this prayer to conform us to his image. And remember how we're understanding the Lord's prayer. It's, it's his words that he puts on our lips through the Spirit. It's God's word that he puts on our lips, and he does that through the Spirit. So, just look back at the prayer, for example. Part of his kingdom come, part of his will be done is forgiveness. Let me say that again. Part of his will be done, part of his kingdom come is forgiveness. Now, the two sides to that forgiveness, there's both our receiving that forgiveness and then our dispensing that forgiveness. You see, there's two ways. It's both, yes, praise God. Aren't you glad that you're forgiven in Christ? Now, here comes the challenge. As you are forgiven, be forgiving. You see, the life of Jesus Christ, think about Jesus, not some video of Jesus that you may have seen. Think about the Jesus of the Scriptures. The life of Jesus, this Jesus, tells us that we are most like God when we're forgiving. We are most like God when we are forgiving. You see, here's what we know. We need forgiveness as much as we need bread. You and I need forgiveness as much as we need bread. You remember what we looked at last week, the lesson from the give us this day, our daily bread? Remember what that taught us? It teaches us that we can't just simply live on bread alone, but by every word from God. And so, in other words, there's this hunger that all of us have, this hunger that bread can't satisfy. It's the hunger that your soul has. And Jesus has come to satisfy a soul. As the old hymn used to say, he feeds us until we won't know more. He feeds us. He forgives us. We are satisfied. And from that satisfaction, we forgive. So, he invites us. You're invited this morning to boldly come to Jesus and ask Him for forgiveness. You're invited. This is His invitation. He says, pray this way. This is His invitation for you to come boldly and ask for forgiveness. You see, there's no reason for you to think that you have to hide from God. Instead, come to Him and find Him faithful and just, John says, to forgive. I try to model this with my children. Listen, when I say things like that, I'm a work in progress. I try to model this with my children. I try to teach them, you know, don't hide things from daddy. A child raised in legalism is going to say something like, oh, I messed up. I better not tell dad. But parenting with grace, that is, Parenting with forgiveness in mind says, I've messed up. I better go and tell dad. Now, telling dad doesn't mean that there are no consequences, but hiding it from dad is worse (laughs) because I want my children to understand that nothing they do, nothing they do can ever separate them from my love. And I want them to know that only daddy can make it better. Well, <clears throat> mama can probably make it more better than daddy. But anyway, <laughs> only daddy can make it better. And the same is true with God, except it's greater. Why would you try to hide something from God? He knows it anyway. No, you get to, he, he, look at what he says. He says, yeah, I know you messed up. I know you've, you've made a mess of things. 
He says, won't you come to me and ask for forgiveness? And he is more ready to forgive. And I'm going to say this at least twice. He is more ready to forgive you than you are even to ask him. Jesus invites us to come as we are and ask for forgiveness. Remember, the proof that Jesus is more ready to forgive than we are to ask, the proof of that is is Jesus Christ himself. God didn't have to save us. He's so powerful, he could have just started the whole thing over, but he didn't do that. After, I love that scene in the Garden of Eden uh, when, when here mankind is, they have, they have uh, sinned, they've violated the law, and the Bible says God comes and they hear the sound of him walking in the cool of the day. And what's he say? He says, Adam, where are you? Now, did he know where they were? Of course he did. But he still came seeking them. And the same is true for us. He knows where we are. He knows our flaws. He sees we're brokenness. And you know what? He loves us anyway. And that's the audacious message. Listen, that's the audacious message of amazing grace. You remember who he is? We sing, light of the world. He stepped down into darkness. He opened my eyes and let me see. He came to love heal, and forgive. This is the Jesus that we serve. This is the Jesus that our world needs. Listen, this is the Jesus that you need every hour, and especially right now. So, here's what I want you to write down. This is two things. It's going to be very simple. Write down this first. Write down this. We are forgiven. Here's the first truth. Oh, what a great truth that I get to tell the church this morning that the Lord has led us to. I get to tell you that in Christ you're forgiven. Now listen, here's the challenge though. Lift your gaze to Him. Don't look at yourself. Look to Him. You are unworthy. You are miserable. You are rotten. You are a sinner. But that's not the point. And that's not all. If you are in Christ, then the rest of your story is this divine contrast. And I was going to say this divine but, but it just didn't sound right. So, this divine contrast. Yes, all of those things are true. All of those things are true about me. But I am forgiven. Jesus has forgiven me. Forgiveness, beloved, forgiveness is the pathway to fellowship with God. Forgiveness is the pathway to fellowship with God. There is no use denying your need. There is no use for you to come and try to make some kind of excuse and say, well, I really don't need forgiveness. Yes, you do. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But that's not all that it says. It doesn't stop there. But you first have to realize your need for a Savior. You're a sinner. And here's the good news. The good news is that Jesus came to save sinners. So you want to be saved? He only comes to save sinners. That's the only people that He saves. He only saves sinners. And you know who that is? Oh, that's all of us. You see, the news is just getting sweeter. Because we're focusing not on, not on our miserableness, we're focusing on Him and His life and what He has decided to do to love us despite our unloveliness. Salvation is only for sinners, and the way that He saves sinners is through this word, forgiveness. And the way that He forgives is through an old, rugged cross. I love the way one pastor put it. Listen to what he says. What God's forgiveness is must be clearly understood. Here it is not a question of an uncertain hope, of an ideal to be sought or imagined. It is a fact even before I ask it, 
God has already granted him forgiveness. He who does not know this prays in vain. Now, don't be off balanced. There's no reason for you to be off balanced. God's already granting your forgiveness doesn't mean that you don't have to come to Him, doesn't mean that you don't have to ask for forgiveness. What that truth does is it instead, it looks at what Jesus said on the cross. You remember what He said? He said three words. It's finished. And it says, since He said it's finished, what am I waiting for? Go on. He's already said a word for your sin. And embrace it. He is more ready and more willing to forgive than you are even to ask because he's already said the final word. Just accept it. In Christ, we are forgiven. Oh, isn't that good news, church? In Christ, we are forgiven. The Bible says that God put forth His Son, this is the language of Romans 3, 25, as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. You say, what does that mean? It means that because of Jesus, we're forgiven. That's what it means. Our wrongs are righted. Our sins are atoned. Our broken fellowship is renewed. He has raised us from the fall all in Christ. In Christ, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, 17, we are a new creation. Oh, it's so hard for you to accept that. It's hard for me to accept that. This is why I need to preach this message to myself and to you as often and as many times as I can. I need it every day. The gospel, not just for Sunday, not just for Monday, but for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and all the rest of the time. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 5, 17, you are a new creation. What does that mean? It means that you are as He is, spotless, pleasing, and pure. And this is all on account of what happens next in that first, 2 Corinthians 5 passage. This is all on account of Him being made sin, who knew no sin so that we could be the righteousness of God. The Bible says that in Christ, we have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been given to you as a gift. The Bible says as a guarantee of your salvation. You have your salvation signed, sealed, and delivered stamped on your heart for eternity. I don't feel like I'm, it doesn't matter how you feel. It matters what he has said. And what has he said? He has said that you're new. He has said that you are forgiven. He has said, ask for forgiveness, and you'll get it. Because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what he said. All, and not just some of it, not just a little bit. Well, there's a little bit left over here. No, it's all forgiven. And this is who you are in Christ. And even, even this Holy Spirit's been given to you as a guarantee. And listen, that guarantee is also in the middle of all your struggle. Read Romans chapter 7. Every one of us in here struggle with sin. Every one of us in here have that relationship where we, the things that we don't do, we wish we didn't do, and the things that we want to do, we don't find ourselves doing. Wretched man that I am, Paul says, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then what's he say? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. That's the message that you get to hold on to. That's the message that is more than you holding on to it. It is holding on to you. You are forgiven. And since you are forgiven, you're free. And since you're free, you have hope. Since you're free, you have hope. Back to that pastor. He says, 
This habit of always casting our eyes on our own sin is gone. Thou hast severed us from the past. In Jesus Christ, thou hast made me a new creature. Thou permittest me to look ahead. I wonder, is is that your experience? Is that what marks your time as a believer? Or do you find yourself looking ahead with hope and anticipation? Or are you here this morning, you're so overcome with your burden of sin? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Hope in Him. Hear his words over you. Forgive us. You are forgiven. You are free. Don't focus on your miserableness. You go crazy. Don't focus on your offenses. Focus on your hope. Focus on your salvation. Listen, focus on the truth. You say, what's the truth? God in Christ has moved heaven and earth to save us, and His saving us means something. You say, what's it mean? It means that you are forgiven. And since you are forgiven, forgiven. Number two, we are forgiving. And this is where it gets hard for us. This is where it gets challenging for us. This is the difference between looking at the building plans and actually forking over the money to build the house. You see what Jesus has done? He's taken the log out of our eyes And if he can remove the log out of my eye, then I know that he has no problem getting a speck out of yours. He has given us new sight. And the new sight that he gives us is through lenses of amazing grace. We don't look at people the same way as we used to. We don't look at people, no matter how audacious they are, we don't look at them as enemies. We look at them as, as we have received forgiveness, and we know the links, because we're, we're aware of our own condition. We know the links that God has gone to to save us, and so we don't look at even the vilest offender in the same way, because we look at them as someone whom God has made. He has, he has made them in His image. And what does that mean? It means that they can be forgiven too. All they have to do is ask. And so we walk around not saying, don't do this, don't do that. We warn people. We say, you're not opposing me. I'm no one. You're opposing God. And there are eternal consequences for the way that you're living your life. And so, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 again, it's more of an appeal than it is a condemnation. It's our appeal to you. We don't have to condemn anyone. John 3 says they're already condemned. It's not our purpose to go and condemn. Our purpose is to hold this message of hope. And how do we hold this message of hope before the world? We have to live it. And one of the ways that we live it is we are quick to do what He has done for us. We forgive. You see, the forgiven, we travel down a highway called forgiveness. The highway to heaven is called forgiven way. And the words of Jesus are clear, and I want to gloss over them. If we don't forgive, we're not forgiven. Now, don't misunderstand. Because this is, this is where we teeter on legalism and grace. Listen closely. It is not do this for that. It's not forgive so that you can be forgiven. The Bible says, look at verse 12, as we have 
forgiven. It doesn't say because we have been forgiven. It doesn't say that. We don't receive, listen, we don't receive forgiveness because we are forgiving. That's the wrong way down the highway. We are forgiving because we are forgiven. And then it gets, it gets real sharp here. Listen, if we are not forgiving, Jesus says you've not been forgiven. It was C.S. Lewis who said, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable in others because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Against all of your excuses that you may have not to forgive, you don't know what he did. You don't know what happened here. And I want to say with you, you're right, I don't. But I know what Jesus has done. And against all of your excuses not to forgive, there stands an old rugged cross with the perfect man hanging. And remember what he cries from the cross? Of all the things that he could have said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You see, this is our salvation because forgiveness brings transformation. This truth, it, it melts our hard hearts. No matter the hurt in your heart, the cross of Christ has a word for you. And the word is forgiven. And the word that he offers you is not just forgiven, it's forgiveness. His forgiveness moves you to be forgiving. Look at our world. The world that we live in is, is so filled with so much hurt. And there's really only one thing that can soothe the hurt of this world, and you know what it is. It's forgiveness. But the world doesn't like forgiveness. Our society runs in the direction of forgiveness, but it never can really take hold of forgiveness. The world doesn't like forgiveness. They'd, they'd rather have something else, something commonly known as, quote, tolerance. But that new form of tolerance that our society is pushing down our throats, it's not like the old tolerance of virtue. This new tolerance, I agree with D.A. Carson, this new tolerance is a parasitic tolerance. You say, what do you mean? It's because it's not based on truth. In the new tolerance feelings are pushed as truth. And this new tolerance in our society, it parades itself as forgiveness, but it's far from it. The new tolerance doesn't know how to define itself because it can't locate the truth, because feelings are always changing. It's always subjective. What I tolerate may not be what you tolerate, these kind of things. There's no location of, of what we tolerate, how we tolerate. And this type of tolerance finds it hard to right wrongs. And one of the reasons that our society is thinking is, is more in line with tolerance than forgiveness is because in our society, listen, truth is up for debate. And there is no forgiveness in a world where truth is up for debate. If there is no truth, then there is no wrong to be committed. And without a wrong, who needs a right? And without a wrong and a right, who needs forgiveness? But you know better. You know better. You know how fake and flimsy that is. 
tolerance. New form of tolerance is a vague substitute for forgiveness. Listen, the Bible doesn't use tolerance to describe God. It doesn't use the word tolerance to describe God. The biblical word, the biblical words to describe God and what we're trying to say is, 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 is much richer than any of those vague notions of, of tolerance. Here's what the Bible says about God. Listen to the difference. The Bible says that God is patient towards us. The Bible says that He is forbearing. You ever had a loan in forbearance? Does that mean that you're not accountable for the loan? No, it means that it's there and it's accruing interest. It's there, and one day you're going to have to give an account. The language that the Bible uses of God is that He is, he is patient, He is forbearing. In other words, God, remember, he doesn't, He's not just some cosmic... Uh, made who sweeps our sins under the rug. The Bible says he's patient and kind. And the patience of God is intended to lead you somewhere. It's intended to lead you to repentance. In other words, what's he doing in forbearing? He, he's, he's giving you in your life, in all of your pursuits, no matter where you go, all the places that you've been, he gives you space to repent space to ask for forgiveness. And the proof of our being forgiven is that we are forgiving. You see, remember, His is the kingdom of the forgiven ones. There are no unforgiving people in heaven. And that same forgiveness that reaches us by grace extends to all The Bible says the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. And if you have this morning a disposition that withholds forgiveness, that's proof that either you've not been forgiven or you've not fallen into your forgiveness. In other words, You've not yet embraced the grace that is embracing you. When we don't forgive, we're not free. We're held. And Christ has come to set you free. N.T. Wright says, failure to forgive one another is not failing to live to a new bit of moral teaching. Failing to forgive is cutting off the branch that you're sitting on. He goes on to say, the prayer is given so that Jesus' followers can breathe in what He's doing, so with that breath come alive with His life. And what's His message? That we then get to live. It's forgiveness. In a life that is alive by grace, it has a certain disposition. It's not bitterness, it's forgiveness. I want to convince you of this. Through the cross, He has moved our sins, listen, as far as the east is from the west. He has cast them into the deepest sea, Micah says. Isaiah 38 says, He has put them away from His presence. Isaiah 43 says, He remembers our sin no more. How can an all-knowing God forget? What's the one thing that He says He forgets? Your sin. And this forgiveness is intended to be transforming. I hope you're getting it by now. Since you are forgiving, since you are forgiven, you are forgiving. And you know, when the truth takes hold of a people, it's not that they can write something on a wall and, you know, we're going to talk about a new mission statement here in the fall. We're going to say live sent. That's what we're going to say as a church. But, oh, it really sounds great. But you know, you know, when the truth of the gospel takes hold of a people. It's not when they can write something on a wall. 
But when there's a sweet fellowship, and in this case, the sweet fellowship of forgiveness, they're so quick to forgive. They don't hold offenses against each other. That's the kind of people that understand the gospel. That's the kind of place that will grow because there's salvation is there. Grace is there. Holiness is there. There's a look not on people's what they can do, what they can't do, but on what God has done. Now, let me say, if that, when that becomes true of us in a deeper way than it already is, the world's going to misunderstand us. The world's going to call us weak. And there may even be some of those so-called Christians who call us weak, too. But just remember, the king you serve is a king who willingly laid down his life to forgive the guilty one. And we are most like him when we are forgiving. The world doesn't understand that. They're going to mock us. Even some religious people are going to mock us. But hold on to 1 Peter 4, 8. It is our love that's going to win the world. I don't care what the world thinks. I care what Jesus thinks. And I want to live my life for Him, regardless of the cost, regardless of the consequences, regardless of what people might say. I want to live for Jesus, don't you? You say, how do you do that? One of the ways that's the most difficult for some is for you to be forgiving. That has this disposition and gives that brother, gives that sister the benefit of the doubt. Imagine that. Somebody giving a Christian, a a Christian brother or sister, giving another Christian brother or sister the benefit of the doubt. Back in 2017, on a Wednesday night during a a prayer meeting at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, the congregation was small. They were meeting for a prayer meeting, and a man from the streets walked in. And of course, this church greeted him, but it wasn't long his purpose became evident as This man, motivated by hatred, simply because of the color of someone's skin, started opening fire while the church was in prayer meeting, killing nine people in the church who were gathered for prayer, one of them being the pastor. At his hearing, the Washington Post reports that There were relatives that were there. Nine, relatives of the nine victims addressed the shooter. And one by one, those who chose to speak at a bond hearing didn't turn to anger. Instead, while he remained impassive, they offered him forgiveness. And they said that they were praying for his soul, even as they described the pain of their losses. I forgive you, Nadine Collier, the daughter of 70-year-old Ethel Lance, said at the hearing, her voice breaking with emotion, you took something very precious from me. I'll never talk to her again. I'll never, ever hold her again. But I forgive you, and may God have mercy on your soul. You know, it's one thing to look at the blueprints of a house. It's another thing to build the house. I remember hearing after that, Marshall Blaylock the pastor of the oldest Baptist church in America, the First Baptist Church of Charleston. In the years following the tragic events at his sister church, Emmanuel, 
he and, and other leaders in the city, they said the reason, back in 2017, the reason that Charleston didn't experience rioting like so many other cities faced after a racially motivated hate crime. The reason Charleston didn't have that is because the community came together. The Christians showed up, and instead of focusing on vengeance, they focused on forgiveness. An amazing story of God's overcoming the unthinkable, forgiven, and forgiving. Remember what C.S. Lewis said, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. You are forgiven, Christian. And the call is for you to be forgiving. You see, Jesus has demonstrated infinite love in that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Grace tells us, as David Crowder says, I'm the one who held the nail. It was cold between my fingertips. I've hidden in the garden. I've denied you with my very lips. God, I fall down on my knees with a hammer in my hand. You look at me, arms open, forgiven. Forgiven. You love me even when I don't deserve it. Forgiven. I'm forgiven. Jesus, your blood makes me innocent. So I'll say goodbye to every sin. I am forgiven. Father in heaven, it's my prayer that we will be the kind of church that holds forth unapologetically the forgiveness of God demonstrated through your Son, Jesus Christ, to us and to all who believe. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he has forgiven us. Now, Lord God, help us to embrace the grace that's embracing us and help us to be the kind of people that are forgiving. Father, this is hard. And I'm grateful even as I pray over the church that you've entrusted me to, that you're mindful that we are but dust. So be gentle with us. And give us strength, Lord, to obey what you've called us to do next. Maybe it's to go home and have that conversation. Maybe it's to pick up the phone. Maybe it's to walk across the street. Maybe, Lord God, it's here this morning and we need to reach across the aisle. Forgiven is the word that marks us. We choose to live this way, entrusting ourselves to your most extravagant grace and love. You who did not withhold Jesus from us, how will you not withhold anything from us? Thank you. Help us. Thank you. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen.